Welcome back to the News at 10. A coalition of civil society organizations in Abuja is giving the federal government a 14-day ultimatum to release all those illegally detained by the DSS and other security agencies. At a news conference in Abuja, the executive director of Enough is Enough outlined the group's demands, including a call on President Buhari to address Nigerians on the direction of his administration. They're also asking him to prevail on the DSS to release all its illegal detainees and respect all subsisting court orders. The coalition comprises the Center for Democracy and Development, CISLAC, Transition Monitoring Group, as well as Enough is Enough. Two key issues of concern to us, namely, number one, attack on our judiciary, and number two, attack on free speech and pattern of silencing dissent. We demand the following. Number one, President Muhammadu Buhari to show accountability as president and commander-in-chief and address the nation on his commitment to the rule of law and human rights. Number two, the release of all illegally detained persons by the Department of Secret Service as revealed by Amnesty, Premium Times, and Punch newspapers in recent months. Number three, that the government obey all pending court orders. Number four, an investigation of the officers who violated protocol and the circumstances leading to Omoyele Shuwore's second arrest. And lastly, the unconditional release of Omoyele Shuwore per his bail terms. If these five demands are not honored within 14 days, 14 days, we call on patriots across Nigeria to join us as we occupy the National Human Rights Commission. Let's take a look at some business news now. Here's Tenyola Shobowali. Banking so easy, so simple. Dial star 894 hash now to experience it. You first, first bank. Welcome to Business News. The president has appointed Mohamed Nami as the new chairman of the Federal Inland Revenue Service, FIRS, which is subject to confirmation by the Senate. Mr. Nami, who was appointed as a member of the Presidential Committee on Audit of Recovered Stolen Assets by President Buhari in November 2017, replaces Mr. Tunde Fowler, whose tenure expires today after a four-year appointment. A statement signed by the Senior Special Assistant to the President, Mr. Gar Shehu says President Buhari has also approved the composition of a new board for the agency. Meanwhile, Mr. Fowler, who was handed over to his coordinating director and special advisor minister, Abiodun Aina, has thanked the president for the privilege he had to serve in the country's revenue generating agency. Now, Moody's Investor Service has changed its 2020 outlook for African banks to negative from stable, reflecting the weakening environment of the countries in which they operate. According to the ratings agency, banks in Nigeria, South Africa, Tunisia and Angola are expected to face the greatest challenges, while Egyptian, Moroccan, Mauritanian and Kenyan banks will be more resilient. However, the global rating firm predicts that many rated banks will maintain good capital buffers and good access to local currency funding and liquidity which will allow them to withstand the rise in risk. Now, the group managing director of Nigerian National Petroleum Corporation, Mr. Mele Kiari, says Nigeria will pursue its crude production drive aimed at increasing reserves despite OPEC pegs. Mr. Kiari, who was speaking on the sideline of the just concluded OPEC meeting in Vienna, Austria, says Nigeria's budget benchmark will not be affected by the cuts, just as no contract will be threatened. The budget level is at 2.18, which means it includes condensate production, both spike and free condensate. And we haven't reached the ceiling of the condensate production. Today we are at 2.2 million barrels production, and we are still within the cap of the uh, 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 supply cut that we have agreed to take to. So we really don't see any challenge with our production quota or even our ability to take new projects next year. In and of course, and of course uh, as we are aware, uh, when you take new projects, you are not producing tomorrow. We are planning for tomorrow. These costs are to balance oil sales and uh, production in 2020 and not beyond that. 
even if there are extensions, there are mechanisms within the, uh, within the OPEC framework to allow for countries to develop and put more production on the table. I don't think those, uh, those chapters are closed. The industry is aware that uh, engagements do take place. Uh, the basis for the, for the court are always adjusted at all times, and I see no distraction to our plans to grow. Now the bears are extending dominance on the equities market as profit taking enters the second week of December. Layo Adegoke has the details. Hello and welcome to the Stock Market Report. The stock market continues the losing streak recorded last week, starting off the second week of December down by 0.65, with about 87 billion naira additional drop in the value of listed equities. The bearish performance is attributed to extended profit taken by investors in high-value equities across four out of five major sectors. The 3.01% and 0.49% loss, each from GT Bank and Dangote Cement, had the most impact on the market market indicators. Market breadth was largely negative, with 28 losers led by 10% price load shared from Beggar Paints, against five gainers led by 9.09% increase on AXA Mansad's share price. Meantime, the trio of Zenit Bank, UACN and Dangote Cement are lead contributors to a total of 192.68 million units traded in over 3,500 deals for the day. Well, that's it on the Stock Market Reports. I'm Layo Adeguki. Thanks, Layo. Now, major markets across the globe also ended Monday's session with mostly negative performance on the back of weak Chinese export data, as well as loss in Apple's share price. Here are some of the closing figures for the day. And that's business news tonight. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Teniola Shoboale. Back to you, Gilma. Dow Star 894 Hash. Now to experience it. You first. First bank. Thanks a lot, Teniola. New Zealand and police have confirmed that five people have died and eight are missing after White Island volcano erupted on Monday as tourists visited. 34 people survived, with 31 of them still receiving treatment in hospital. The casualties include tourists from Australia, Britain, the US, China and Malaysia. Let's head over to our London studios now. Here's Simon Pusey with Around the World in Five. Good evening from the Channel's newsroom here in London. Police believe there are no survivors on the island in New Zealand, where a volcano erupted, killing at least five people and injuring many more. Footage from tourists on a boat trip by the volcano captured the moment of the eruption. Up to 50 people were believed to be on the island. Five people are known to have died, while 23 were rescued, some of whom are critically ill with severe burns. Reconnaissance flights over White Island have not identified any further survivors, and police believe anyone who could have been found alive have already been evacuated. Rescuers have been unable to search the island because of the risk of new eruptions. The country's deputy police commissioner told reporters that both New Zealand and overseas tourists were believed to be involved. Due to the current risk, emergency services are unable to access the island. The physical environment is unsafe for us uh, to return to the island. Meanwhile, overnight eruptions from Mount Etna lit up the Sicilian sky on Sunday. The eruptions led to rivers of lava streaming down the southeastern slope of Europe's highest and most active volcano. Mount Etna often erupts but rarely causes damage, while the eruptions themselves do not put the local population at risk. A fresh fire broke out in the New Delhi building on Monday morning, where 43 people lost their lives a day before in a fire due to asphyxiation. Four fire engines were rushed to the spot to control the small fire caused by burning waste and police was seen barricading the area and controlling the crowd. A horrific factory fire in India 
was believed to have been caused by an electrical short circuit as relatives of workers trapped inside identified victims from photos on police officers' phones. At least 43 people died in the blaze in the capital New Delhi and another 16 were being treated for burns and smoke inhalation. Sana Marin is to become the world's youngest prime minister at the age of 34 and will head a woman-led coalition government in Finland. The transportation minister was picked by her Social Democratic Party to take charge after the Prime Minister Annie Rin quit. She is expected to be sworn in this week. She will lead a centre-left coalition of five parties, all headed by women. Mr Rin stepped down after losing the confidence of a coalition member over his handling of a postal strike. U.S. presidential hopeful Elizabeth Warren has released details of her past legal income, showing she earned almost $2 million in work for corporate and other private clients dating back to 1985. 70-year-old Miss Warren is a front-runner in the race for the Democratic nomination and a frequent critic of big business. The Massachusetts senator had already shown 11 years of tax returns, but rival Pete Buttigieg, a mayor in Indiana, has been challenging her to release older tax documents. Climate activist Greta Thunberg has arrived at the United Nations Climate Talks in Madrid, where she addressed the media alongside young activists and indigenous groups. She arrived in Madrid on Friday after crossing the Atlantic on a catamaran and spending a few rest days in Lisbon. Meanwhile, demonstrators have been protesting across the world. An eight-year-old activist climbed a streetlight with a banner to demand action. Elsewhere, Extinction Rebellion climate activists were arrested after gluing themselves to a roadblock they had erected in central London. The activists said the location was chosen due to the high levels of air pollution in central London, which they claim causes the death of 25 Londoners every day from various illnesses. Back in Madrid, Greta Thunberg told reporters that she would use her platform at the climate talks to shine a light on other people's stories. It is so incredibly important that we listen to to indigenous people because they are they are suffering and they, their rights are being violated uh, across the world and uh, they are also among the ones who who are being hit the most South Africa's Zozi Bini Tunzi has been crowned Miss Universe and says she wants to help black women feel beautiful. The 26-year-old said she grew up in a world where a woman who looks like her was never considered to be beautiful. On accepting the award, she said, may every little girl who witnessed this moment forever believe in the power of her dreams. Zozi Bini is the first black woman to win the competition since Leia Lopez in 2011. And finally, the world's largest private collection of whiskey ever to go on public sale has been unveiled by auctioneers who believe it could attract up to £8 million. More than 3,900 bottles of rare whiskey, primarily single malt scotch, make up the collection gathered over decades by the late American businessman Richard Gooding. His family has put the collection up for sale at auction online. Perth-based whiskey auctioneer Ian McLoon said that there had never before been a collection like it on sale. And that's your international news around the world in five. Thanks a lot, Simon. Still ahead on the news at 10, World Anti-Doping Agency bans Russia from participating in all major sporting events for the next four years. That's on sports. Do stay with us.